Hey there, everybody, and welcome to Investing with IBD, sponsored by North Coast. I'm Justin Nielsen, and of course, as always, I'm joined by my co-host, partner in crime, Arusha Pires from O'Neill Global Advisors. Uh, it's Wednesday, October 20th, 2021. And on today's show, we have a really great person to talk to, Lauren Simmons. Now, Lauren was the youngest person trading on the New York Stock Exchange for a while there. And she's got an upcoming series called Going Public. So uh, Lauren, welcome to the show. I'm so excited to be here with everyone. <laughs> so we're excited to have you. So uh, first of all, let's let's get right to it. Uh, I just want to kind of find out. Um, this wasn't, uh, you know, trading on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. This wasn't really the thing that you were thinking about as you were a little girl growing up. Like, oh, this is what I want to do. What happened? You know, how how did your path veer so so uh, take such a curve? You know what? By being open and adaptable to all in every situation, I will say, although I did not seek out the New York Stock Exchange, I will say the New York Stock Exchange sought me out. Mm -hmm. I have always, my background, have been in white male dominated spaces by either being the only or the other. My background was in genetics and prior before that was architectural engineering. So coming to Wall Street wasn't anything new. Uh, but the day that I graduated college, I hopped on a plane to New York and through the power of networking, I ended up at the New York Stock Exchange. I was specifically looking to further my skills um, when it w involving numbers because of my, my strong background. Um, and someone told me, would I be interested in applying for an equity trading position at the New York Stock Exchange? And I said, yes. And uh, the rest is history. <laughs> yeah. And now how much experience did you have? with stocks before making that decision? Zero. I think for <laughs> people, I think people, what they, they don't realize so often is that you don't always have to come into a job with credentials. I think if a company wants you, they will help and prepare you to be successful within that role and, and becoming a junior trader to, you know, isn't, um, I'm not going to say a hard feat, but it's something that you learn hands on. And it's not anything that you can learn in a textbook. It's something that you actually have to learn um, while on the floor, wherever you're at trading in real time, which is very different from day trading. I don't know <laughs> the audience that's listening and how many of you do that. It's a completely different thing. But um, yeah, I, I learned, you know, while I was on the job, my, my first six months uh, was very intense. Lauren, what was one of the biggest things you learned as a trader on the floor? The biggest thing you guys are going to one, one of the big one of the biggest lessons that you've learned that you're applying to uh, your your next endeavors. Well, well, I, I have two really big ones. One is accountability. As a trader, if you make a mistake, there's no hiding behind anyone else. And I think. Um, when there was a time and I'm not aging myself, but I worked with men who did paper trades, you could easily hide trades under your table and not have to like worry about that because, uh, there's a digital identity to each trade that's now being done in 2000, anything you can't get to hide. You can't get to blame anybody. So yeah, I once made a $3 million error and I had to own up to that. And that was my first year on the trading floor. It wasn't a comfortable situation to be in, but it was something that I had to be direct. How do we work through this? How do we make it right? And we did. Um, the second thing I learned that most people don't know, but the majority of men on the floor do not actually trade um, in the stock market. These are now men who have currently gone through three recessions and their philosophy is that you can't beat the game and they look at other ways to invest their money. Mm. Very interesting. So, and, and just so our audience understands, how old were you when you uh, were, were trading on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange? I was 22 years old. 22 wow. years old. So I'm just thinking back to what I was doing when I was 22, and it was not that. <laughs> <laughs> we, but we don't have to go into those stories. Um, so now let's uh, kind of shift focus a little bit. Um, you know, let's talk a little bit about what you've got coming up. And I think one of the most interesting things is the series that you've got. Uh, called Going Public. And a lot of this uh, has to do with uh, the, 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 the bringing the retail investor in, into this. And you've certainly been in a position where you kind of saw the, the high level people, um, you know, more, much more so than the retail trader, but now you're really getting involved with the retail trader. So uh, describe a little bit about what your series is about and what you're going after. Yeah, so Going Public is, it's for me, mostly it's about 
uh, giving everyone access to have a seat at the table that Wall Street has so often left out. And I think going public, um, they're disruptors in the space, as I was a disruptor in the space. And they really are about empowering the next generation when it comes to investing and being better at investing and realizing that you don't have to invest in the traditional ways. You can invest in companies early on pre-IPO, which so often to be able to invest in pre-IPO, you needed to have a net worth over a million dollars. And so through Regulation A+, which was signed into law by the Obama administration, anyone over the age of 18 globally can be able to invest in these companies. And I think what is so phenomenal is that through the power of storytelling, and not just not just ongoing public, but in general, to be able to look at companies and say, I am a consumer of this company, I I believe in this brand, I believe in, you know, this company, and to be able to invest in it early on is so groundbreaking in so many ways. These companies could potentially be the next Amazon and Tesla, and they can get in early on. So how how do people find out about these companies that qualify? So is it Regulation A+, plus? Uh, how, how do they find out about a list or how do they get access to this? Yeah, so at least all the companies on the show or, or anyone that's going through the Regulation A process, you you have to go through all the, the process and you end up with an SEC offering circular, which that is where you do your due diligence. You understand if these companies are risky or not risky to invest in. I mean, yes, the, the circular is very uh, lengthy, but I tell people that, you know, really do your due diligence. If you're thinking about investing, this is not a short term gain. This is something that is happening long term with investing in general. And you should really adequately take your time to research and understand why you're investing in these companies. And so what I love is obviously the shows, the companies on the shows, we're following them, you get to read their offering circular, you get to decide if you want to invest or not. And you also get to the added layer is get to pull back that curtain and really see in real time what entrepreneurs are going through, which I think is a big narrative part of going public. Entrepreneurship isn't as easy as people assume. And anyone else who's going through that process that wants to go through reggae or wants to get listed can see, okay, this is what happens at a roadshow. This is how we pitch institutional investors. And this is how we're pitching everyday investors like you and me to be able to uh, participate in, 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 in raising money for these companies. Yeah. And, and, and you talk, talked a lot about that due diligence part. And I guess one of the concerns that I have, and look, I'm guilty of this myself. I don't always do the greatest due diligence. Sometimes I almost outsource that to uh, institutions. You know, I figure, okay, they've got their research departments, their analysts that are kicking the tires on these things. Once I see some of those institutions, you know, with, with the with a solid record, then I'm like, okay, they, they've, they've done their, their due diligence. And so I'm not going to get caught, you know, in something that's, you know, maybe sketchy. And this is something that's happened certainly with a lot of uh, Chinese names, you know, on, on occasion. Um, so is there anything that you can suggest for people, um, you know, again, people that might not be so familiar with the accounting and financial principles um, in order to do that due diligence when maybe some of the institutions haven't kicked the tires as much on some of these companies? Well, I know when it comes to uh, reggae and at least, and again, the companies on the show, off the show, what I love, yes, it is a very lengthy uh, offer circular, (laughs) but you can, my favorite page is the investment risk and it puts it in black and white. What are the investment risk of being, you know, putting investing in this company and so i think if you want to be short-sighted you can look at that if you you know don't have the financial literacy to understand everything that's going on google research you know understand what it is that you're reading but that the one most important page i think if out of all the pages to look at is what are the investment risks in investing in these companies and i think that will definitely give you a snapshot of you know what you're actually looking at um but you know it it I don't don't rush the process. And it is very easy to to look at, you know, analysts and to look at reports or list to listen what's on CNBC or even IBD. Um, but I, I just think, you know, take your time, do your research and and do it when it feels comfortable for you, not because someone else is doing so. Mm-hmm. Lauren, is there a, a minimum amount or is there kind of a typical amount that uh, investors at this stage are, are putting in the retail investors? For the the companies on going public or just in right. general, the yeah, for any public, these I'm sorry. They they each have their own set of guidelines and rules as far as okay. uh, what the minimum is. So that yeah. is yeah. 
Okay, that makes sense. I mean, that it, it's kind of reminding me of even within real estate, where now you're having some more of these uh, companies uh, essentially acting as a REIT or something where they're taking right. a minimum of like 15, 20,000, 50,000, and you're buying like an apartment building mm-hmm. and you're getting kind of the mm-hmm. cash flow. So th- that it's really cool that some the number of these barriers are, are starting to come down because it is giving access to, to more people. Yep. Mm-hmm. And uh, just one thing that, uh, you know, kind of comes to my mind is, in, in 2000, of course, this is when when I was first starting in the stock market was just a few years before 2000. And of course, in 2000, we had a lot of stocks that were coming public. And, you know, a lot of times all they were doing was really just slapping dot com on their name. And they didn't have any business plan. And, you know, everyone was kind of talking about the new economy and how, you know, this time it was different and everything like that. Um, so, you know, Fast forward to, you know, here we are in 2021, we've had a lot of IPOs come out this year, a lot of people trying to get access to that funding. We've had, um, you know, the SPACs, the special purpose acquisition companies, those have been very popular and even to the point where the SEC kind of had to crack down a little bit on regulations there. Um, Do you think that if this, you know, regulation A plus starts, you know, gaining traction, are we maybe um, getting a little bit too greedy getting, you know, are these companies trying to get Funding while the while the iron is hot is that a sign of a potential top? Is that a concern of yours? I don't think so. I think you know if you were to ask me what I think of SPACs, I'm not a proponent of SPACs. Honestly, um, there's too many nuances around it, and you know these are blank check companies that they're looking to acquire, and they have you know a certain amount of time to acquire it. And statistically, if we're looking at the data, they don't usually acquire companies, and so what does that usually go back to? The shareholders, they get money, and I'm not even going to go on that long, that long. I think Regulation A plus is different because you are getting crowdfunding from institutional investors, but also retail investors. And again, you get to actually see in black and white what the investment risks are. These are completely different from a blank check company where they might say they want to get a company in the tech space and then might get someone in retail because that happens. Um, and I think at the end of the day, um, especially when it comes to, you know, Regulation A+, plus, you know, there are going to be risk in any type of investment, but that that's really why you should be able to educate yourself. I think when it comes to SPAC, there just isn't enough information for me to say, yes, I would want to invest in a SPAC. It, it's just not out there. Getting back to kind of your your path here and, you know, in, in reading about you, one of the things that, you know, struck me is um, the whole idea of, you know, how much you learn from others and, you know, mentorship. And, you know, I mean, I had the benefit of, uh, you know, getting to be mentored by Bill O'Neill, who, by the way, uh, was, you know, the youngest person to purchase a seat on the exchange, you know, back at the, you know, the ripe old age of 30. You know, I mean, he, he wasn't doing it at 22, but, uh, you know, he had the seat on the exchange at 30. Um, so maybe you could talk a little bit, um, because mentorship really seemed to be that thing that altered your path. Um, how important is that for you? And, um, what, what do you think is, you know, I guess the, the part that you can give back in terms of your own mentorship? Yeah, mentorship is important. And I know it's such a nuance for people who are younger, like 18 to 30. And it's like, how do I find a mentor or sponsorship as quickly as possible? And what I always say is, you know, mentorship is a lot like dating this, you, the first person that you see, you don't say, hey, will you marry me? It's, you know, a little bit of courting, a little bit of dating, and it's a very two-sided relationship. And so while I do think mentorship is important in a lot of ways, realize that your mentors, your group will come. There will be people that will be advocates for you and they will want to be mentors. And what I've realized at the grand old age of 27 is that a lot of your mentors, you, you wouldn't even like they don't know that they are mentors. Like my mentor, I told him the other day for the first time, like, yeah, I don't know if you realize, but you're a mentor to me. And he's like, really? Like, cause we've, I, that's not something I, I call him as a mentor, but now he knows. And he's like, well, I guess that makes sense. Um, so mentorship is, is obviously important. And for me, being a woman, being a woman of color in the space is so important. While I think, um, at least when it comes to the financial industry, Every mentor of mine has been a man and, you know, I'm very happy for that. I do wish that there, I had, you know, a woman sisterhood around me. And so I am doing everything in my power for this next generation 
uh, to be that because I, I, I do think women supporting women is one of the best things that we could do. And honestly, if we did that a little bit more, we would rule the world. <laughs> we would rule the world and we would probably have, um, you know, you guys statistically, you're not even statistically, there's only been 22 IPOs that have gone public that have been woman founded. Wow. wow. 22. That is, that is, that's heartbreaking in so many ways. Yeah, that's staggeringly low. Especially when you consider, I, according to Renaissance Capital, between the IPOs and SPACs this year, I think that they're projecting for 2021 yep. uh, alone, I think we're looking at over 800 is, yep. is the projection. So, yeah. Um, well, and, you know, to, to that end, I guess, um, you know, a lot of people may struggle with, you know, when, when you're, when you're, kind of thinking about this whole mentorship, you know, a lot of people are like, well, gosh, I'd, I'd be taking so much from this person, you know, getting so much knowledge from them. What, what could I give in return? So what kind of things could you offer as advice in terms of how, how you offer something to someone that seems like they might not need anything? Yep. Get out of your head, get out of your head. I think for me, one of my mentors that wasn't in finance, um, I remember he, I did a lot of soundboarding with him. Um, but one day I was really frustrated and wasn't really looking for an answer, wasn't really looking for his help. And I started venting to him about a lot of different things. And he actually had a solution, had a great solution and wanted to be helpful. So the thing is early on in your career, and even maybe at the midpoint of your career, you might not have anything to offer to your mentor. That is perfectly okay. It's okay. At some point in your career, you will be able to give back. And if it's not even giving back to your mentor, it's giving back in other indirect ways. So I think establishing that relationship, having a conversation, being okay with some people just want to be in a place of giving and receiving. Your mentor could just be in a place of, I want to give, I want to help. And they don't want to receive anything in in return. Everything doesn't have to be transactional. So again, I think the right people will align with you. It will take a, a bit of years and maneuvering and having these diff different organic conversations, but it will happen the way that it's meant to. Have you started to mentor people now? Now you, you've started to progress in your career. Has, has that opportunity start to pop up? I'm, it's eventually going to stop. I'm sure happen if it hasn't, but uh, oh no, has, it has. It already? I, I, I get blown up on, on LinkedIn. Oh, okay, perfect. Right? There you go. On a daily basis, and yeah. I wish I could help everyone, but it, but especially women, I try to give as much advice, especially in male-dominated spaces, not just finance. Of you know some of the things that I went through and some of the tips and tricks um, that that I've gone through. Again, it, it's a, it's a marathon, not a sprint. So a lot of these relationships are still fairly new. I've only been in the financial industry for five years, but I'm, I'm so happy to be in a place to, to help and to give advice. And I want, I don't want people starting as far back as I started. If they can get the tools and the resources that I used to get ahead, I want them to use that and, and to go on. And I personally don't want anything in return. I just really want to help and empower that next generation, especially women and minorities. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. So um, last thing here, Lauren. Uh, so for people that are maybe interested in finding out more about your series going public, um, I know it's coming out soon. How can they find out about it when it comes out and uh, where to access that? Yes, you can find all new updated information on goingpublic.com, as well as going public on all their social medias, LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter. You can also follow me for any updates on Instagram and LinkedIn. And we will see you guys all very soon on entrepreneur.com, streaming, going public. And I'm so excited for you guys to be able to watch and to hopefully click to invest. Mm -hmm. I'll definitely be you, watching Lauren. that first uh, first episode, see, see what it's all about. So thank you so much, Lauren, for being on the show and kind of telling us your story and what you've got uh, in the fire. And I think it's a little funny that you're like, you know, oh, man, you know, as far back as you started. Yeah, because at 22, being a <laughs> man, you know. I'm 27 you know. now, so it's been five <laughs> right, years. Right, okay. <laughs> thank yeah, you, so. thank you, thank you. I really appreciate the time today. Okay, take care. Thank you. Okay, and when we come back, Arusha and I are going to be taking a look at the market and also we'll go through a few stocks that are looking interesting. Stay tuned. To help alleviate some of the pain that comes from bear markets, we recommend investing 20 to 25% of the equity portion of your portfolio in a tactical strategy. If you are especially risk averse, we recommend a higher percentage. In 2008, 
the market declined 37%, yet our portfolio was only down 12%. Why? Because the conditions for investing were poor, so we held a lot of cash. Visit northcoastam.com slash tactical. All investments involve risk, including loss of some or all of an investment. It may not be suitable for all investors. Past results do not guarantee future performance. Welcome back to the Investing with IBD podcast sponsored by North Coast. It's Justin Nielsen here along with Arusha Paris. And now let's go ahead and take a dive into the market. And of course, in the next segment, we'll talk about some stocks. So uh, let's start maybe with the NASDAQ composite. Well, since we had our last podcast, uh, we were taping it uh, and the day that we were taping it, we did not have the follow through day yet, but we got that the very next day. So how has that adjusted your thinking, Arusha, on the current market environment? It's given me a little bit more confidence. I think it was on that and it was October 14th. We were up 1.73% on, on volume that was greater than the day before. So on the NASDAQ, it qualified. I don't think we got it on the S&P, but naturally when you get a fall through day, it gives you a little bit more confidence that, okay, we might be changing here. We might be changing that trend. And uh, it was not only the markets itself, but some of the stocks that were doing really well and that just pulled back, especially just pulled back to their 21 day moving average, they took off. And so the combination of both uh, was, was telling me that, okay, may, maybe we're going to start to pull out of it. And so far, so good. We'll have to wait and see. Um, a lot of times they'll come up, get back above the 50, then come back in for a week and test the 50. So um, we're, we're still not out of the woods just yet. Right. But it's certainly, you know, the the, the first thing that you want to see is, uh, of course, getting back above that 21 day moving average line, which, you know, we did uh, on the follow through day. Then we got back above the 50 day moving average line a couple days later. So it seems like that would kind of be the beachhead that, you know, if we can stay above that line, that would be great. And actually uh, for the NASDAQ composite, we're now above 15,000 again. And so that's a level that we were above for just a few weeks um, before we, we kind of pulled back again. So if we could kind of uh, build build a beachhead right here, that seems like another area that would be a, a nice area of uh, support to form. But again, we might lose that level temporarily um, and that would be you know, very normal. Um, I guess what was really interesting, again, when we were talking with Scott St. Clair last week, um, even before the follow through day, we had a lot of stocks that were setting up that were looking interesting. And mm -hmm. it was kind of already uh, pulling a lot of us in where we were, you know, hey, I, I, I bought a few things. Um, so I guess, you know, to kind of you know, give, give people a sense of how, how we do it, and everyone's different, keep in mind, um, how in, how heavily invested were you getting before the follow through day, maybe on the follow through day versus now that we've had some progress getting made? Yeah, I, I, now if I remember correctly, it, I because I think it was last week on Wednesday when I usually do IBD live. On that day, I was saying I'm I'm starting to get a little bit more bullish here. There, mm -hmm. some stocks are starting to set up, so I was buying there. So I probably might have been like at 20% invested before Wednesday. Then I went up to like 30%. On the fall through day, went up to 50%. And now I'm around like 70% or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. So just slowly scaling in. Now, in the end, it really just, it all depends on if there are stocks that are giving you an opportunity to get more exposure, right? right. Sometimes these indexes will mask what's going on underneath the surface, uh, and they're, or the indexes might come back too quickly and it hasn't given enough time for stocks to really base or really just take some kind of rest. But that wasn't really the case this time around. Uh, you had at least, you had a lot of stocks that came back to their 50 day moving average and then others that just only found support at their 21 day. They, they were so strong, they didn't even come back to their 50 day. Uh, so it was more, they, they weren't so many that were building bases there's there are plenty that are starting continuing to build bases right now but it seems like at least to me that the the first ones that are kind of out of the the gate were ones that found support on either the 21 day moving average or the 50 day moving average yeah and those were definitely the ones that had the higher relative strength as well you yes. know with the indexes below their 50 day moving average lines um the ones that were the stocks that were holding above their 21 day moving average lines certainly uh were reflecting better relative strength lines now let's just kind of recap a little bit too from last week, we were talking about pilot positions. Um, how did you handle some of your pilot positions? Uh, did you just end up having a lot of small positions or uh, was part of your 
increasing exposure, adding to some of those pilot positions? And how did you do it without getting too top heavy and driving your average cost up too much, uh, kind of retaining that cushion? Yeah, it, that's a really good question. With the pilot positions, if it, so the ones that were that I had near the 50 day as they were building the right hand side as a basis, I, I was able to increase them a little bit. If they're around the 21 day, yeah, I, I couldn't really increase them, right? So sometimes those pilot positions, if the market doesn't really go into a correction, and I feel like this was more an intermediate pullback so far and not a real correction, uh, in those cases, you just might have some really small positions that you can't do that much with and you may have to eventually just get rid of if there are too many other stocks that are giving you the opportunity to get more uh, normal sized positions. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the areas that we were looking at, um, you know, certainly that seemed like there were a lot of setups. Uh, we were talking about computer software, especially the enterprise stocks. Um, you know, IGV is, is one. I, I, I kind of hesitate sometimes, uh, you know, putting too much weight on this one because it's got, uh, you know, some, some stocks that we're maybe not as interested in, not the, the high flyers uh, that we're seeing in the computer software enterprise. But you also had uh, computer software security, uh, you know, that was looking interesting. Um, but in addition to that, what was interesting is on the follow through day, I mean, some of the stocks that were moving the most were in like materials, uh, you know, some of the steel stocks and, you know, some of the, uh, again, we've had this sector rotation underneath the surface, um, you know, so, you know, we, we had XLB, uh, which is the um, the materials um, that one was 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 moving up strongly on the follow through day. Um, even some of the industrials, um, you know, we've been noticing that the fertilizers, uh, mosaic is one example. You know, that one uh, was moving even before the follow through day. It was you know some of these were breaking out and again getting getting above the 50 day moving average line before the indexes. Um, so is, is sector rotation uh, still alive and well? And is that factoring into your, your equation at all? I think it is still alive and well. Uh, yeah, you know, it, I found it very hard to kind of go back and forth. Um, I'm more kind of tech, tech related, more growth related. And so it's harder for me to go more towards the the agricultural type of stocks mm -hmm. or the energy stocks. Oh yeah, I almost for, completely forgot oil. Let's not forget that. Yeah, yeah. exactly. That was yeah, really so early on. You know, making it's and I'll pull the, the XLE today. here. It, yeah. it now if if you were nimble and and you got back into a number of these energy stocks, uh, you didn't have a correction, right? You, yeah, right. You completely, <laughs> you're you're you you were you managed it very very well, and uh, you're you're up. Uh, pretty good you're up quite a bit um if, because some of those energy stocks really took off uh so so in that case if you're going with what's been happening this whole 2021 now you want to lighten up on some of those energy stocks maybe not completely get out of them but lighten up on them free up some of that money and look for some of the other stocks that are starting to base out starting to get back above the 50 and build the right hand sides like like the shipping stocks that that mm -hmm. went up uh, really quickly a couple months ago. And that's definitely been the challenge. It seems like as as soon as something starts making progress, um, you know, the, the trends are only lasting a few weeks, uh, sometimes as opposed to a few months where, uh, you know, you're getting the benefit of those compounding gains. Um, you know, sometimes the moves are just short. And uh, if you're not nimble, as you said, and kind of taking the profits into strength and then moving it into something else, then you could easily be, you know, watching all your gains disappear. And, uh, and if you're, if you're buying breakouts, this is again, one of the problems that this market has had is sometimes the breakouts, um, you know, you're, you're almost late to the game. If you've gotten something that's come straight up off the bottom, uh, hasn't really taken a break. And then by the time the breakout happens, oh, well, that's, that's when the break happens. Yeah. Now uh, to, to answer your question a little bit more about the rotation and how I've been handling it. Now, this time around, you know, I've, I've been paying a lot more attention to, to the rotation. So uh, it's almost guaranteed that we're going to go back to the previous environment. <laughs> right, exactly. Where the stocks are as soon as you adjust. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I hear you. I, I mean, you know, for me personally, I was I was actually a little disappointed in myself that I I got in a little bit heavy um, quicker than I wanted. Uh, and while it did work out, 
you know, in, in my favor doing that. Um, the reason why I was disappointed in myself is because that's how I've gotten myself in trouble in the past, you know, getting, getting too heavy too early. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, I, I really try and train myself to focus on my process, not my outcome. So even though the outcome was good in this case, um, I, I was not following my rules in terms of my process. Uh, so even though it worked out, um, you know, that's, that's something that I've been burned, burned with in the past. And I need to make sure that I don't do that too often. Um, but again, just, you know, recapping on the NASDAQ composite because of that follow through day, uh, we kind of wipe away the distribution um, count, you know, reset that, but also keep in mind that, you know, this was really not a big correction. This was an intermediate correction. Um, when Bill was writing about corrections in the you know, how to make money in stocks and talking about the follow through day, it was really in more prolonged downtrends uh, slash bear markets. So, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to be nimble and again, stay in phase with the market. Um, you know, today's action uh, was a little bit weak on the NASDAQ. Uh, a lot of tech names were, were getting hurt, some of the ones that had been moving strongly. Uh, the S&P 500, by contrast, was, uh, was up today with, again, a lot of those uh, materials, industrials, real estate uh, help, helping out there. But we should also take a look at FFTY just to kind of get a sense of growth. Um, you know, that, that is, you know, coming right back up to those February highs uh, that we were at. And uh, again, we, we kind of challenged those levels briefly in September um, before we topped. And it looks like we're, we're making that ground up again. So again, IBD50, really does focus on that growth component. Um, and, and, you know, FFTY, the innovator IBD50 ETF, uh, kind of reflects what's happening in those, those 50 stocks. Um, so yeah, let's go ahead and uh, take a break right now. And when we come back, we'll go ahead and talk about some of the stocks that are on our radar. So stay tuned for that. To help alleviate some of the pain that comes from bear markets, we recommend investing 20 to 25% of the equity portion of your portfolio in a tactical strategy. If you're especially risk averse, we recommend a higher percentage. In 2008, the market declined 37%, yet our portfolio was only down 12%. Why? Because the conditions for investing were poor, so we held a lot of cash. Visit northcoastam.com tactical. All investments involve risk, including loss of some or all of an investment. May not be suitable for all investors. Past results do not guarantee future performance. Okay, welcome back to the Investing with IBD podcast sponsored by North Coast. It's Justin Nielsen, your host, along with Arusha Piras from O'Neill Global Advisors. And let's go ahead and take a look at a few stocks that are jumping on our radar. So why don't we start out? Uh, one of the areas of strength that really seemed to come on strong was the financials. So, um, a lot of the regional banks, uh, and this, this is where it's tricky because, you know, a lot of times we look at the industry groups and we have 197 of them, but, you know, we kept on going through a lot of these group names and you'd see like, oh, the, the Northeast regional, you know, banks, the Southwest regional banks and, and you know, the super regional, um, but KRE is one way to kind of play that entire space. Um, and this was another one of those that was showing a lot of strength even before the follow through day, got back above its 50 day moving average line, um, was crossing a downtrend line. Uh, so a lot of things were looking very strong about this. Um, so now that we're back up near new highs, uh, is it is it too late to get in on this? Or is it one that you're waiting for it to take a break? No, well, I mean, if, if you if you're looking to buy the ETF, I don't think it is too late to get into here because it's emerging out of a large base. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's worth a shot. If, if the, you have to, you know, in the end, you, know, you never know until you try it, you try it. And if it doesn't work, then you cut your losses and, and, and you're out. Right. But the, the one reason why I think that it has a chance this time around is what you were saying at the beginning, Justin, there were a number of these regional banks mm -hmm. that all of a sudden it was probably the last few hours of the day. I, I just started noticing all these regional banks just starting to pop, break pop, out pop, or all right, they, yeah. they were starting to act like tech stocks. Yeah. So that, that's why I was like, I started looking around like on uh, and the news sites to see like, did the Fed release anything uh, about tapering more or whatever? Because the, all these regional banks are really starting to come on. Now, financials have been acting very well for the last month, six weeks or so. And so there were plenty of banks that, emerged out but now you're starting to see these smaller regional banks they're starting to catch up and they're starting to break out of pretty big bases too so 
the KRE has a chance here simply because underneath the surface, there are a number of stocks acting pretty well. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, because we're in this environment where a lot of people are looking at the Fed action, we've got uh, potential tapering happening uh, next month. And then, you know, a lot of people are looking at next year uh, with potential rate, uh, rate hikes. Um, all of those certainly play into the hands of profitability for the banks as they get that spread of what they're what they're borrowing versus uh, what their what their lending rates are at. Um, you know, the bigger the spread there, the, the the better it is for them. So is that something that's going into your equation here? Or is it really just, gosh, the technicals really look so good on these? Well, a lot of times I'll see it on the technicals first. Right. And then I'll go back and then I'll start reading about it and say, oh, OK, yeah, it, the, the rates are going to go up. Banks are poised to, to do well and, and things like that. So a lot of times, like that's how I just end up finding the ideas. You just notice that some stocks are just acting well. Uh, so but yeah, there is a larger under fundamental catalyst underneath the surface that's pushing all these stocks. And that's always the case. Um, so yeah, it, it, the market right now is that they're they're really betting on that. Yep, this is going to be the time where rates are truly going to go back up. Mm -hmm. um, it's just a little bit, not not that much, but um, it, the the Fed's not going to you know keep the punch bowl out for much longer. <laughs> right. uh, and, and everyone I'll, knew this was coming. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So that that's kind of how the, where the money's going right now. They're kind of it's just kind of shifting towards these stocks that are are going to benefit from higher rates. But at the same time, and we saw this in September, you know, a number of technology related stocks or more higher valuation stocks, um, they're going to get hit because with the higher interest rates, that's just going to uh, drop the, the appeal to some of these longer duration um, type of growth stocks uh, that more depend on lower interest rates. Right. And so I guess uh, in a related note, a lot of people are also looking at the home builders and you would think that, you know, uh, an expectation of higher rates would be would be hurting uh, some of these guys. But if we just take a look at Lennar, uh, ticker symbol L-E-N on that one, um, and this one's not alone, you see a lot of these that have been Again, a little bit of this sector rotation where it was a little out of favor. Uh, this was below its 200 day moving average line, but breaking a downtrend and now it's back above its 50 day moving average line. Uh, you know, despite a higher rate environment that's looming, um, are home builders still uh, poised to, to take advantage of these, you know, high home prices? Well, I mean, a couple of things could be happening here with, with kind of the 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 knowledge that rates are going to go up it may push people who are kind of putting off moving into another home or getting a home and things like that so we got to quickly rush and get a home um the other thing could be and i, I don't know about you justin but i've noticed that la is a little crowded uh, <laughs> and you know it's not a lot of places to live around here um but that being said you know a lot of people may be enticed and say you know what let, let me leave some of the larger, more crowded cities, go out to the Southwest where there's more land and where a lot of these home builders are putting up a lot of newer homes and for a lot less money and things like that. So that could be going on too. But that being said, Lennar is slowly crawling up. It's not showing that huge enthusiasm that I guess in the past that it had a little bit or some of these home builders had, but you know, it, 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 it could, if, keep building that right hand side of the base and potentially give another buy point in the near future. Mm -hmm. And again, it's, it's not just the home builders, but there's, it seems to be that there's a lot of the retail uh, stocks in that space. I mean, I was noticing that Lowe's and Home Depot and, yeah. you know, um, floor and decor, a, a lot of those seem to be uh, coming on. And again, part of this is the market itself, right? We always talk about how the market, you know, lifts a lot of boats, um, you know, but it, it does seem like this is another area of strength of related fields. Um, so let's well, go Justin, ahead. It, well, it's interesting because when you compare like a Lunar mm -hmm. with a floor and decor or a Home Depot or a Lowe's, the charts really are, are saying that people are more willing to stay in their homes yeah. and rebuild their homes, right? Go oh. to a Home Depot, go to a Lowe's, mm -hmm. do it yourself, rebuild the current house 
versus going and looking for another house, right? Because those stocks that you mentioned, technically, and on a relative strength basis, they're much stronger than what we're looking at here with Lennar here with only an RS rating of 63. But if I, if I pull up Home Depot, that has an RS rating of 75, and then Floor and Decor, RS rating of 83, right? Mm-hmm. So if you're just looking at that, the story is more that people are just going to more rebuild their homes and they may be getting also scared about the interest rates going up. So they're going to take their home equity loans or whatever, and just rebuild right. their home a little bit more. Uh, and th- maybe Lennar is not going to do as well. And maybe the home builders aren't going to do as well um, because mm-hmm. people are just going to stay. Uh, let's go ahead and end uh, the, the program here with a look at Keysight in a little bit of a different industry. This is in the electronic scientific measuring, um, but really, this is a 5G play. Yeah, uh, so they create instruments that all the 5G companies or really all the phone companies as they continue to install more and more 5G antennas and uh, th- and measure them and they need a test to see if they truly are 5G or whatnot. They're using equipment from Keysight. So this is, uh, this falls in the category of the picks and shovels. Picks play, and shovels, right. right. <laughs> um, so it's done well in the past. It's been, it's done well for a lot of this year uh, and it's starting to build the right hand side of the base. And right now with the, the cup that it's forming, if that, if it's just going to form a cup, the uh, the buy point for this is 182.49. Mm-hmm. Um, and do you see, you know, again, a lot of times we talk about these these downtrend lines that will sometimes draw. Uh, it was a little steep on this one, so yeah. uh, is that a little bit better to wait for that that higher price? Also, when it did cross that downtrend, it was still below the 50-day moving average line. So, is it better to go with a a little less steep trend line? Um, a lot of times I'll just use the 50 day if I yeah. really want to get in stock as a first entry, then you could use the, the, the less steep uh, trend line as the second entry. If you draw them too steep, you just open yourself up to get whipped, uh, whipped around two more. But that being said, you know, even, even this time around where the market uh, kind of pulled back for 7%, we don't, apparently we just don't have any real true corrections. Right. In it. So, That's a thing of the past. Yeah. <laughs> right. exactly. Obviously we're kidding, you know, yeah. but uh, uh, it, it's been a long time since we had one of those kind of bone crunching, mm-hmm. uh, get a lot of uh, buy the dippers uh, out of the markets or, or really uh, put, uh, put a hurt on buying low. So right. Well, and, and again, with a lot of these times where you're, you know, doing that break of the downtrend, a lot of times you can really keep your risk very low. And, uh, you know, again, if you're only risking a little bit with the potential, even in this case, to get back up to new highs and even beyond, that's a lot of return that you have the potential for with very little risk. And uh, that, that's usually a, uh, the kind of equation you want to be, you, you want to be going for. So uh, that'll wrap it up for us on this episode. Thank you so much for joining us and make sure to join us next week when we have John Najarian from Market Rebellion joining the show once again. And of course, he is an options expert that has so many great uh, setups and things to say about the options market um, and and just stories on everything uh, that he's looking at. So we'll be looking forward to learning a lot from him again. So thanks for joining us on this one and we will see you next week take care. And for this week's notes and charts, make sure to go to investors.com slash podcast, where you'll find details for each episode in the podcast episode section. And make sure to subscribe, rate and review our podcast if you haven't already. We'd really appreciate it. You can also send us your questions and comments to investingpodcast at investors.com. We would love to hear from you and may use your comments on an upcoming episode. Hey everyone, thanks so much for watching Investors Business Daily on YouTube. If you wanna watch more videos, make sure you hit that subscribe button so you don't miss a thing.